March 27, 1977. On the idyllic Canary Islands, a popular holiday escape, two titans of the sky, the Boeing 747, were on a collision course with fate. Pan Am's Clipper Victor and KLM's The Ridden were majestic symbols of the golden age of air travel. But on this day, a chain of seemingly minor events, a distant threat, mounting pressure and a blanket of impenetrable fog, would converge on a single runway. In a matter of minutes, a series of catastrophic miscommunications would trigger the world's deadliest aviation accident, a tragedy born from a single fatally ambiguous word. The day's chaos began miles away, at Grand Canaria Airport. A bomb, planted by a separatist group, had detonated in the terminal, and a second threat was phoned in. Authorities scrambled to shut down the island's main air hub, diverting a flood of international flights to a small, ill-equipped regional airport on the neighboring island, Tenerife North, then known as Los Rodeos. Los Rodeos was woefully unprepared for the influx. With its single runway and a parallel taxiway that was already congested with parked aircraft, the airport's infrastructure was stretched to its breaking point. Air traffic controllers were forced to use a portion of the active runway itself as a temporary parking lot, creating a logistical nightmare. Critically, the airport lacked ground radar, meaning the control tower was effectively blind to the exact positions of aircraft on the ground once the weather turned. And the weather did turn. A dense, wet fog, notorious in the region, swept over the airfield, drastically reducing visibility to less than 300 meters. Inside the KLM cockpit, pressure was mounting. The crew, led by the airline's esteemed chief of flight training, Captain Jacob Van Zanten, was approaching their legal duty time limit. Any further delay meant an overnight stay, a significant cost for the airline and a major disruption for passengers. For the Pan Am crew there was only growing frustration. They had been patient but now they were trapped, burning fuel on an overcrowded airfield they never intended to land on. The tower instructed both jumbo jets onto the active runway. The Pan Am flight was told to taxi down the runway and exit onto a small taxiway designated C3 to clear the path for the KLM jet behind it. But in the fog, the unlit poorly marked turnoff was nearly impossible to identify. The Pan Am crew struggling to see, believed they had passed it. Meanwhile, the KLM 747 was cleared to taxi all the way to the end of the same runway, perform a 180 degree turn, and hold for its takeoff clearance. Now, two fully loaded 747S were facing each other on the same strip of asphalt, completely invisible to one another and to the control tower. This is where the chain of errors became a chain of death. Impatient to depart, Captain Van Zanten began advancing the throttles for takeoff. His first officer was radioing the tower for clearance. The first officer transmitted, We are now at takeoff. This was not standard phraseology, it was a statement of intent, not a request. The tower controller, also under pressure, replied with the ambiguous phrase, OK, stand by for takeoff, I will call you. The word OK would prove fatal. At the exact same moment the Pan Am crew radioed in, we're still taxiing down the runway, Clipper 1736. The two simultaneous transmissions collided over the radio frequency, creating a loud three-second squeal known as a heterodyne. In the KLM cockpit, this squeal completely masked the Pan Am crew's warning. All they heard clearly was the controller's OK. Believing they were cleared, Captain Van Zanten said the final words, we're going, and pushed the engines to full power. In the Pan Am cockpit, sheer terror. First Officer Robert Bragg screamed, there he is, as the KLM's landing lights burst through the fog, hurtling towards them. Captain Victor Grubbs yelled, god damn that son of a bitch is coming, and slammed the throttles forward, yanking the controls hard left in a desperate attempt to swerve his massive jet off the runway. The KLM crew saw the Pan Am jet at the last possible second. Captain Van Zanten pulled back violently on the yoke, trying to force his plane into the air. The 747's tail struck the runway, scraping for 65 feet as he fought for altitude, but it was too late. At 1706 local time, their worlds collided. The KLM's undercarriage and engine sliced through the top of the Pan Am fuselage. The KLM jet, mortally wounded, stayed airborne for a few more seconds before stalling, slamming back onto the runway and erupting into a 300-foot-high fireball. The Pan Am jet was torn open, its fuel tanks igniting in a series of secondary explosions. In the fiery aftermath, the scale of the tragedy became clear. All 248 passengers and crew aboard the KLM flight were killed instantly. On the Pan Am flight, a miracle amidst the horror, 61 people, including the pilots, managed to escape the burning wreckage by climbing through holes in the fuselage. In total, 583 lives were lost. The investigation laid bare the lethal combination of fog, radio interference and human factors, but its most profound legacy was the revolution it sparked in aviation culture. The disaster led to the creation of Crew Resource Management or CRM. Before Tenerife the captain's authority was absolute. The investigation revealed the KLM first officer had seemed to question the captain's actions but was not assertive enough. CRM flattened this hierarchy, empowering every crew member to challenge a decision they believe is unsafe, fostering teamwork over authority. Furthermore, aviation phraseology was completely overhauled, ambiguous terms like OK were banned from critical communications. The word, takeoff, is now used when giving or reading back a takeoff clearance. In all other contexts the word, departure, is used. 
These changes, along with the widespread implementation of ground radar, were written in the blood of those lost at Tenerife. The Tenerife disaster remains a haunting reminder of how quickly a normal day can descend into the unthinkable. It stands as a testament to the fact that in the sky, clarity, procedure and teamwork are not just best practices. They are the sacred principles that separate a routine flight from a catastrophe. The echoes of that foggy afternoon are now embedded in the DNA of modern aviation, a lasting, silent tribute to the 583 people who died, ensuring that from the ashes of the deadliest crash in history, a safer sky for all was born.